Okay, let's get started. Basically, I'm going to continue where I left off last lecture, but we're also going to, um, in some sense, dive into something a little bit new. So we touched upon some of the topics in this lecture already in the second lecture when we talked about exploration and exploitation. But there we talked about a very simple case where there is only one state, and uh, essentially the, the multi-armed bandit case. And we had a lot of control over what we knew about the problem. We knew there was only one state, there was a limited amount of actions that you could pick from. And we mostly focused on the uh, topic of then learning how to explore and to exploit. Um, because in a sense we had full control over the policy. The policy was in some sense very simple. Now in this lecture I want to talk about the more general case um, of learning policies directly from the data. And this can be used in, um, as we'll see, in combination with the things we talked about in the past lecture, which was focused mostly on learning values. Um, but it's a separate objective. And just to, before we dive right in, the motivation for this is basically this. This is one way to think about it. This is a quote by uh, Vladimir Vapnik, who's well known for his work on uh, support vector machines and uh, statistical learning theory. And in one of his books, he poses, uh, I think I'm slightly paraphrasing here, so this might not be a direct quote, but um, he says something uh, like, never solve a more general problem as an intermediate step. Where the idea behind this is, if you're going to solve the more general problem, this is necessarily harder than solving the specific problem you're interested in. So for instance, if you think about data efficiency, in order to solve a more general problem, uh, you're necessarily going to need more data, or at least as much data, as to solve the problem you're actually interested in. And so applying this to reinforcement learning, if we care about optimal behavior, if we care about the control problem, then why not learn a policy directly that solves that? Why go through models or value functions? Why not just go for the policy itself? And there's actually good reasons why you would want to do that, which I'll touch upon in this lecture, but it's good to consider, and let's just go with that for a little bit at first and just consider that um, a viable objective. So as an overview, um, these are some, this is not an exhaustive list of pros and cons, but these are some things you could associate with different types of reinforcement learning. So to start off with, model-based reinforcement learning has certain benefits. It's easy to learn a model in some sense. That's not actually that easy in practice if your world is very complex and it's an active area of research. But when I say it's easy, I mean it's well understood because it's supervised learning in a sense. So we know kind of how to do that. And another benefit of learning models is that you basically learn all there is to know about your problem. If you're trying to basically learn the dynamics of the world, you're definitely not um, shooting too low and you're capturing everything there is to know about your problem. However, the objective captures irrelevant information, and in particular, it might focus uh, compute or capacity on irrelevant details. So what do I mean when I say that? And let me give you a concrete example. Let's think of uh, playing an Atari game, and let's think of solving that by first, doing, first learning a model that tries to capture the essence of the Atari game, basically to, to, to Determine when you take a certain action, how does the one frame transition to the other frame? That's something you could consider doing for building that model. Let's not consider the planning yet, which is then still hard, but just learning that model. But now let's imagine the exact same setup where you're playing this Atari game, but we've replaced the typically black or like uniformly colored background with some arbitrary video that's playing. Now, if you don't tell your model that this is irrelevant, it'll focus a lot of capacity, for instance, of your neural network, if you're using that to, uh, to learn the model, on these actually irrelevant frames of the video playing in the background. In some sense, the supervised objective of learning the dynamics is not necessarily informed about how we want to use those dynamics, which means you might waste a lot of compute and effort and function <laughs> approximation capacity on learning irrelevant details, which turn out to maybe hurt your performance in the end, because you might not have spent enough time learning about the relevant details, the things that matter for your policy. And as a final potential disadvantage of model-based uh, reinforcement learning, it's not always trivial, depending on how you do this, to go from your model to a policy. You might still need planning. For instance, again, if you think about the Atari case, uh, 
we actually have access to a simulator, so we can actually try each action in, in every um, state that we happen to, uh, to end up in. So if you then learn a model, you basically learn something which is very similar to that simulator. There is a benefit of having a model, because you could query it, you could put in an arbitrary beginning state, a frame that you've uh, maybe not even seen before, and you could ask your model what will be the next frame if I push this button in this situation, which is something that you can't necessarily do with the black box simulator of the game. But still, it's not trivial to then go from that to a policy. You might still want to then learn a value function or a policy from your model, which means we may have made some progress, but maybe not all the way there to the, uh, to the optimal policy when you do model-based reinforcement learning. Now, of course, this is a little bit of a cartoonish view because model-based reinforcement learning, it typically we don't, we don't um, assume that you're going to just learn a model and then you're on your own. There's ways to use models that are much more efficient, ways to use them that, so that they're well suited for planning. Um, I just wanted to point out that that's non-trivial and it's actually an active area of research as well. Now, we mostly spent our time talking about value-based reinforcement learning. And this is the benefit that it's closer to the true objective, because we might not care about all the irrelevant details of a transition function. We only care about the things that matter in terms of the value that each action um, has, in terms of the, for instance, the cumulative reward that you're predicting for each action. So this is closer to the true objective. And indeed, if we have the true values, reading off an optimal policy, as discussed before, becomes quite simple. For instance, in the, uh, in the discrete action case, in this lecture, we'll also talk about continuous actions, but we've mostly focused on the discrete action case. If you learn a, an action value function, a Q function, then you can just read off the highest valued action in each state, and this gives you a policy immediately. So it's fairly easy to go from these values to a policy. And it's also fairly well understood these days. It's similar to regression, although not precisely the same because of the bootstrapping potentially. Um, but we have algorithms that work quite well and can learn these values uh, quite accurately. However, it's still not the true objective, and you might still focus capacity on less important details. Now, to give you a very um, a slightly abstract example, but you could imagine that there is a setting in which you, uh, you, you, for instance, have a robot, and you want to control that robot to have an optimal policy. And it just turns out that the optimal policy in that specific setting is for the robot just to drive forward. It could be very easy to learn that. And it could also be very easy to represent that policy. Just in every state, you don't even look at the observation, you just go forward. But that doesn't mean that the value is actually simple. It might be that the value um, changes a lot depending on the exact observations of, of the robots. For instance, things might pop up in its vision which may um, slow down the robot temporarily or might even cause it to, to go a little bit off of its track. It might still be optimal to keep on pushing forward for the robot, but the value function might change arbitrarily. And in order to accurately represent it, you might need to have uh, a fairly rich function approximator, like a deep neural network, whereas in this case, the policy could actually be blind. It doesn't even have to look at the observations. So this is just an example to show that in some cases, the value function might be quite complex, whereas the policy could be quite simple. And in those cases, if you go through a value function in order to, uh, to learn a policy, you might be spending more effort than you need, in some sense. Now, finally, the policy-based uh, reinforcement learning, which we'll cover uh, in this lecture, is basically the right objective. We just focus on learning a policy that optimizes the value without learning the value separately, potentially. And that's nice because it's actually what we should be focusing on. So it seems to uh, fit with uh, Vladimir Vapnik's quote from the previous slide. There are downsides, though. And one potential downside is that it ignores all other learnable knowledge. One thing that this might mean is that it might be very slow to get off the ground, if it gets off the ground at all in some cases, because it might be very hard to pick policies that give you any meaningful performance if you're not first learning, say, what the values are of certain actions. So in some cases, you still need to learn more in order to, uh, to even be able to learn the policy. In addition, it might just not be the most efficient way to use all the data, because if you're using each sample to update your policy only, there might be samples from which you can learn very little in terms of the policy, but they might still teach you a lot about the world. So in some cases, it might be beneficial to still predict lots of stuff, to maybe even build a model, even if you're only using that to sculpt the knowledge inside the agent. For instance, you can think of a deep neural network, which has maybe some convolutional filters at the bottom. It might be useful to start try to learn lots of stuff about your problem 
even just to get good features, to get good filters that look at relevant parts of the environment. So this is indeed sometimes done, where in some cases people use a deep neural network, which at the, as the output has a policy, and I'll talk about this more concretely in, a, uh, in, in, the, in the subsequent slides, but if you just imagine abstractly there are some observations coming in and there's a policy coming out, even in that case it might be useful to hang off other predictions, which could be model predictions or maybe value predictions, just to learn the parameters of that function, even if you're not using them in any other way. This is just because it's more data efficient if you use more of your data to update all of your parameters in your model. And if some of these parameters are shared, because you use, for instance, the same conf uh, net filters, then this can be quite beneficial. But for now, we're going to basically acknowledge that this is the right objective, and we're going to talk about how could we learn this. Okay, so this is a recap. Previously, we approximated, I see there's a typo there, uh, parametric value functions. Um, slight notation difference here, I'm going to use, as uh, the new Sutton and Barto edition does, I'm going to use W to refer to the parameters of a value function. And then I'm going to reserve theta, which in the past we've used to uh, just talk about the weights of your value function, to talk about the parameters of your policy. In some cases, these might partially overlap, such as I just said in the case if you have a deep neural network where multiple things hang off but they might share a lot of weights, so some of these weights might actually be um, shared by both of these. But we won't focus too much on that. For now, you can just consider these to be two different weight vectors, which, for instance, if you're using deep neural networks to represent these, just capture all of the weights of that network. We're abstracting away the architecture of the network, um, which is important, but we'll not talk about it in this lecture. And then the idea is quite simple, to parameterize the policy directly. So we're going to have something that is dependent on those parameters. And the semantics of that is that it gives you the probability of selecting a certain action in a certain state under those parameters. And we'll mostly focus on model-free reinforcement learning in this lecture. So this is then the high-level picture, where we have value-based reinforcement learning on one end. Um, Maybe with an implicit policy, so that's the part of the Venn diagram there all the way on one side. Then you could have policy-based reinforcement learning where you're just representing the uh, policy. And just to make you aware of terminology, there's also something called actor critic systems. And what these do is they use a value function in some way, and I'll show you some examples, to update a policy. And the actor critic uh, terminology then comes from there's an actor, which is your param parametric policy, and there's a critic, which is your value function, where the critic in some sense criticizes the behavior of the actor in such a way that the actor can more efficiently learn. There's many ways to combine these, and I'll show you some examples. So these things are not fully uh, disjoint. They're often used together, the value-based reinforcement learning and the policy-based reinforcement learning. Again, by the way, stop me at any time whenever you have questions. Is the um, actor critic function first learn value and set the policy and then combine them using the um, That's a good question. Do you learn the values and the policies simultaneously, or do you first learn a value and then use that somehow to learn a policy? And it turns out, in practice, what most people do is to learn them both simultaneously. This is a little bit akin to what we talked about previously when we said there's policy iteration where you first evaluate a policy and then you improve it and you could treat these as separate steps but you could also inter um, interleave these at a very fine grained uh, time step. Maybe even on the same time step you could evaluate and improve. This is what Q-learning for instance does. And this is one way to think about these things. You could do that and in some cases it actually makes a lot of sense to first make sure your value function is very accurate before you start using it to improve your policy. In other cases, you can get away with just improving both of them at the same time all the time. It's a very good question. So here's some uh, zooming in a little bit on the policy-based reinforcement learning. Here's some more advantages and disadvantages. Um, one advantage is that at least some of these methods have fairly good convergence properties because, as we'll see, it boils down to, in some cases, just doing something that is stochastic gradient ascent in this case, but it's very similar to stochastic gradient descent, which means you'll end up, if you have a nonlinear function, you'll end up in some local optima um, fairly reliably. Um, 
depending on the assumptions that you can make. Um, another big, big advantage is that it's very easy, as we'll see, to extend to high dimensional or even continuous action spaces because we parameterize the policy. We don't necessarily have to reason about individual actions anymore that much. Um, and it turns out it's very easy just to use the same algorithm, but you just plug in a different representation, which then happens to capture continuous action. And I'll give you some examples. Another benefit, which is sometimes uh, not appreciated that widely, widely, is that it's actually a benefit to be able to learn stochastic policies. But I'll go into that in, in, on, I think, the next slide. Yeah, so I'll talk about that more. And this is one that I already said. Sometimes policies are quite simple, whereas the value functions or the models can be quite complex. That's the example that I just gave where the, the actual optimal policy might just be just move forward, but the value function might be quite intricate and depending on your observations. There's also disadvantages. It's quite susceptible to local optima, especially with nonlinear function approximation. This is something that is shared with the value functions in some sense, but for policies it might even be a little bit more tricky because the policy is also what gives you the data. Um, also, the obtained knowledge is quite specific, with which I mean the optimal policy doesn't capture, the policy that you're learning doesn't capture any information except for what you want to do. But then if something changes, there's very little you can generalize. Whereas if you have a model, and if you say, if say only one thing changed in the world, maybe you can very quickly learn that this one thing is different, but all of your other knowledge stays relevant. So if you're continually planning using a model, uh, a lot of the knowledge that is in there might continue to be relevant even if the world around you changes a little bit. Now why might the world change? Maybe there's other agents in the, in the world. Maybe at some point somebody unlocks a door, say. You could still know that you can walk there and then you could try to open it even if you, you don't have to relearn that. Um, but if you just learn the policy that just goes somewhere, it might be very hard for the policy to completely switch to then doing something else because simply there's not much knowledge in there. So this is related to the third point where we're ignoring a lot of information. This is something I mentioned uh, previously as well, which means that in some sense we not, might not be making the most efficient use of all the information that is in the data that comes at us. In some sense, if you want to be efficient in learning, you want to learn all that you can from all the data that you get in terms of data efficiency. So this is... Um, uh, one example of why maybe you want stochastic policies. You can consider a two-player game of rock, paper, scissors, where scissors beats paper, rock beats scissors, and paper beats rock. And now you can consider a policy for the iterated game. If you have a deterministic policy, no matter which one it is, you're very easily exploited. Um, and in some sense, a uniform random policy is optimal if both of the players are learning. If the other player is not learning, you could maybe exploit the other player, and maybe then, again, it could be that there's a deterministic policy. Um, but if the other player is uh, either learning as well, or it's a good player, then um, it might learn from you. It might tr keep track of statistics from your play, and it might exploit you if you're not uniformly random. As a different example, which might be maybe even a little bit clearer because it's a single agent case, you can consider this very small uh, grid world, where there's, um, there's eight states, there's essentially three goal states, two of which are bad and one of which is good. So whenever you enter these, when you enter the one with the, uh, uh, with the money bag, you get high reward and this is good. When you enter the states on either the left or the right, um, the, agent, the agent dies or gets a like, large negative reward and the episode terminates. And now specifically, the way it's set up, these two gray states on the corridors are indistinguishable from each other. It just happens to be this, uh, this way in terms of the features that the, the robot sees. For instance, if the, um, if the agent in this setting can only see whether there's a wall, north, west, south, east, or up, down, left, right, if you prefer, um, then both of these states will both have a wall on the top and a wall at the bottom, so they're indistinguishable from each other with that observation. So if you just consider that to be the, the thing that you, that, you, that you have to base your uh, policy on, and if you're not allowed to, say, use memory or anything like that, then a deterministic policy can only do one thing, um, in some sense, in both of these states. 
it could only go left or it can only go right in each of these states. So considering one of these, this is the one that goes left. Let's say you can start in any of these states. What will happen is, if you start here in the top right corner, say, you'll go left, you'll go left again, and then you'll go down, and you're happy. But if you start on the top left, or in the gray state next to that, it'll never actually maybe go down into the, uh, into the bad state, but it will continue to go left and right, because whenever it ent enters this gray state on the left there, uh, the deterministic policy there says it has to go left. Now you might want that to go to point right, but when you flip that to point right, the other gray state also flips, and you get the same problem on the other end. So what will happen here is that you can get stuck, and you never reach the, uh, the good state, and it will just traverse the corridor indefinitely. It's not fully bad in the sense that it doesn't actually end up in any of the really bad states, but this is the best you can do with a deterministic policy in this case. Now if you consider having a stochastic policy, you can do better. Um, you could pick in each of these indistinguishable gray states to randomly move either left or right. Whenever you end up in a corner, you say, oh no, wait, I went the wrong way, I go back, I try again. And whenever you end up in the middle, which you can distinguish because it's the only state that only has a wall on the top, then you just move down. Now this isn't fully efficient, but it's the best you can do in some sense, because the only reason this isn't fully efficient is that we really couldn't distinguish these two states, and there's really nothing better you could do there than just to randomly move to one way or the other. Um, but if you can only represent deterministic policies, you cannot reach this solution. So there's a benefit to being able to represent stochastic policies. And if you represent your policy explicitly, if you parameterize your policy explicitly, this becomes possible. There's an example in the, uh, in the book, in the Susan and Barto book, uh, where similarly um, epsilon greedy is compared to being able to put these probabilities to specific values. And there it's shown that also epsilon greedy doesn't completely save you in the sense that in this specific problem, sure, epsilon greedy will eventually reach the, um, the desired goal state, potentially. Um, although it might also sometimes walk into one of these bad states. But um, in the example in the book, it's in some sense even simpler. It just shows you that the performance can be better if you can more arbitrarily pick these um, probabilities. As an intuitive example, you can also think about playing something where there's hidden information, which is the same case here. This is essentially a POMDP. DP. Uh, but you could think of, for instance, the game of poker, where you want to sometimes bluff, but you don't want to predictably bluff or predictably not bluff. So you want to be a little bit unpredictable, and one way to do that is to have an actual stochastic policy. In addition, though, one thing to point out is that the policy can be differently stochastic in different states, which is something we haven't considered with the epsilon greedy policies we've discussed in the past. For instance, in this case, the stochastic policy might be uniformly random in terms of picking between left and right in these gray states, but it never picks up. Similarly, in, say, the top right states, you deterministically move left. And you can represent this if you have full control over all the policy, uh, sorry, over, over all the action probabilities in each state. So when I say stochastic policy, I don't mean it's random in every state. I just mean you have control over the probabilities of the different actions in each state. So model-based models, is it uh, is stochasticity also useful, necessarily? Hmm. It's a good question. So if you do something model-based, do you need any stochasticity? There's multiple reasons why that might still be useful. One is just exploration, which I'll actually touch upon later again. This wasn't about exploration, but um, that one we discussed in the past quite a bit. Um, another reason why might be is um, it depends basically on whether it's a mark of decision process or not. If you have a mark of decision process, there's going to be a deterministic policy that will have the optimal solution. So if you can fully solve your model by planning through it somehow, say using dynamic programming, then, uh, and it's a mark of decision process, then you could maybe find a deterministic policy. But what happens often in practice, um, so when our mark of decision process is used, they're used in reinforcement learning, but also often in something called operations research, um, where people try to just find good models for real problems and then solve them. And quite often things are modeled as mark of decision processes.
But of course, these are approximations to the real problem, which means that the thing that we're solving might be a Markov decision process, but the actual underlying problem might not completely fit to the model. So if these things don't completely fit, you might still be better off using something that is not quite deterministic. It doesn't fully trust your model, in a sense. It's a good question, thanks. So this was more like an intuition of why, why would you want these things to maybe be stochastic. But then the question is, of course, how do we learn these things? In order to talk about how we learn, we first have to decide what we learn exactly. And essentially, it's not that, it's not that um, controversial or surprising, perhaps, um, that essentially what we want is a policy that has a high value. And it turns out we could just basically take that immediately and turn it into an objective. Now, there are some different ways to do that. So I put some on the slide here. Um, because it might matter a little bit which states you care about, how you reason about this, what is the actual thing that you care about. And one thing you might care about is from a certain start state, I want to have a good policy. This is the first objective. We pick out a certain state, or maybe a certain distribution of states, and we say we want the actual value, v pi, of that state to be high. This is an objective which is similar to a loss, but we're going to want to maximize this rather than minimize it. We just want to maximize the value. And now this thing is a function of the parameters of the policy, theta, because the value depends on the policy which depends on the theta. This is just a definition, right? I'm not plugging in a learned value here. I just say this is what we want to achieve. This is what we want to optimize. Now, in some cases, there isn't really a natural starting state that you care about, but you might more care about um, the states I actually happen to end up in. So another thing you could do is you could define a distribution over states. And in this case, we've picked the distribution mu over states which is the one that is induced by the policy you're following. So the, the way to think about this thing is it's a summation over states. If your states are continuous, you can just turn it into an integral. These are the, uh, the same in a sense. And this is just the ratio of time, these, these, these mu's, for each state that you spend in that state when you follow that, that policy that you're following right now. That's one way to think about it. You could, of course, also define an objective where this thing isn't actually weighted by the current policy. You just say, I'm going to say these states are important and those aren't. That's perfectly fine. And in the book, you'll find some uh, more discussion about that case. This is a fairly natural one, though, because in some sense, you might just care about doing well in the states you end up in. And you might not care so much about doing well in the states that you never run, end up in anyway. And in a very, essentially a very similar objective at the bottom is, just look at the average reward. And this might look a little bit weird if we're used to the value functions, because why is the average reward, how does this capture the future? I mean, value functions were uh, predictions about the future, where we were talking about all the, all the rewards that might come. Um, but this one now looks at the immediate reward. But the reason this is still valid or a useful thing is because we're looking at all the states you might end up in, which captures the dynamics. So this does um, use the fact that you might end up in many different ways. So it's a valid objective to consider. And in fact, it's a very common one for people to actually put, for instance, uh, in their plots or in their graphs, where they say, oh, the average reward I got was this um, per time step. Um, so if your sequences are very long, um, so the average reward case again has this distribution over states, which is just essentially the ratio of time you spend in each state. So both of these uh, term, uh, sorry, both of these formulations, the average value and the average reward case, they can apply um, just fine to a fully continuing problem that might never terminate. There might be no episode boundaries in some sense. But we are assuming that there is maybe some meaningful uh, region of states that you end up in. 
So you don't indefinitely go enter new states. If, if that were the case, it's a very, very hard problem in general to solve. Um, but this mu distribution captures that. It basically says, oh, when I just follow this policy indefinitely, in the long run, in maybe infinite time, this is the ratio of time I spend in each of these states. Again, this is just defining it, right? So I'm not saying anything about how to learn this yet. I'm just saying this is the objective that you might consider. And then in practice, what we'll do, we'll sample this, for instance, just by using our actual behavior uh, on policy distribution. And that's why uh, the mu, the state distribution on this slide, is dependent on our current policy. Because that means we could just roll out our policy and we could just pick the states that you happen to end up in and that will be a valid sample for these uh, objectives. Now to optimize these objectives, that's an optimization problem. So we want to find a theta that maximizes in this case this, this, this objective for any of these objectives that you might pick. Um, there are, of course, ways to do that that do not use a gradient. So I put hill climbing here as a generic optimization method. You can use genetic algorithms or evolutionary strategies are quite um, popular these days. Um, and that's valid, right? You could, you could as we will see, we'll, we can sample these objectives. You could call that a fitness if you prefer and then do something evolutionary on top of this. And this is actually a valid way to do this. You could basically use any optimization method to do this. Um, we will mostly focus on this lecture on stochastic gradient ascent, which is very similar to stochastic gradient descent. We're just going in the other direction. Uh, and this turns out to be of, often quite efficient and it's also easy to use with deep neural networks because it turns out we just backprop gradients as usual. Doesn't mean it's the only method. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that, but I won't go into depth into other ways to do that. So then it maybe look, roughly looks like this. You have some objective, and we just want to hill climb that in some sense. And policy gradient algorithms, they look for a local maximum by locally looking at the direction in which this thing goes up. So what we'll do in general um, is we'll have some change to our parameters, delta theta. And we'll say that this, in some sense, is equal to a small step along the gradient but no minus sign, right? We're doing gradient ascent rather than descent. And if you take these steps, you should be moving up, which means if the objective is, for instance, the value from all of the states you end up in, that we're actually getting to states with higher values. We're getting a policy that leads us to better values. Again, this is just defining these things, which seems fairly easy. One thing that I want to notice, of course, again, as I did before, I'm just going to put the gradients on the slides. But if you have a gradient, you can put that into a, a more advanced optimizer like RMS prop or Atom or whatever your preferred flavor of optimizer is. And you can use that to, optimize, uh, to update your parameters instead. But for simplicity for the notation, I will just put these things uh, on the slide as if we're doing the standard stochastic gradient des descent uh, or ascent algorithms. If you want to do this, by the way, in practice in something like TensorFlow, um, TensorFlow optimizers expect a loss and they'll minimize. So you have to be careful that if you want to maximize this, that you actually put the negation of this in. Minimizing uh, the negative uh, gradient is the same as maximizing the, uh, the gradient. This is a common error. So if you run a policy gradient method and it seems to do very, very poorly, just try putting a minus sign and maybe it'll learn. Okay, so we need an estimate of this gradient. It's all fine to define these things, but of course that doesn't give us a concrete algorithm that we can run. And we want to use the data to do this. So what we'll assume is that the policy is differentiable almost everywhere. And this is a fairly natural assumption. So we'll, we'll have a policy that's, for instance, a linear function of the agent state, or it's a deep neural network of your observations or of your agent state. Um, or you could even have a bunch of expert controllers and just switch between these, right? Maybe you have a bunch of controllers that are handcrafted by somebody else and you just have like a, a few parameters that switch between these controllers somehow and you just learn those parameters. You could think of all of these cases. So it's quite easy maybe to put in some domain knowledge in that way. And the goal here is to, uh, to compute that gradient, which is the gradient of an expectation. Um, sorry, I see there's a slide. I was changing notation on these slides to adhere more to the Susan and Barto book. Uh, 
um, where they use mu to talk about the state distribution. In the past, we used d. So this d here is the same as the mu from the previous slides. This is just a distribution over states, because the only thing that's random in that, uh, in that expectation there is the state. We put in the true value. That thing is not random. This is the true value of that state, but the thing that's random is the state. And we're considering some distribution over those states, which could just be maybe your start state distribution, in, if you're interested in that objective. So at first, we'll use Monte Carlo samples to compute this gradient. But for that, we first have to decide how this expectation actually depends on theta. And to do so, we'll go through some steps that we went through before in the bandit case. Uh, and first, for simplicity, we'll discuss the one-step case, where there is no sequentiality. There's just you take an action, you get a reward. And then the objective becomes maximize your expected reward, where the expectation is over states and actions. Um, we cannot sample, as discussed before, and then take a gradient, because the sample is just a number. It doesn't depend on your parameters anymore. So instead, we use the identity that the gradient of this expectation equals the expectation of a gradient, which is the reward times the gradient of the logarithm of your policy. And I'll show the proof of this again on the next slide. We saw that in the second lecture as well. And then why do we do this? This is because the right-hand side gives us an expected gradient that we can sample. This is an equality. These things are equal. But of course, then the right-hand side can be sampled and used in an algorithm. So the derivation of that uses the uh, score function trick, or the reinforced trick, as it's sometimes called, or the log likelihood trick. It has many names. Um, and in order to do that, we first just write out this first expectation. So there's a summation over states with the distribution over states. And there's a summation over policy with the distribution over policies, where in this case, the policy distribution is exactly the thing that we're interested in. The policy distribution is our parametric policy that gives us the probability of selecting an action A in a state S. And then we get the reward function, which is here just defined as this is deterministically maybe the reward that you get in this action in this state. Of course, you could also have a noisy reward. Basically, it all goes through. Um, but for simplicity, this would just be the reward that you get in that state action, or the expected reward that you get. Then one thing we can do, we can push these, this gradient all the way inside up to the point where we find something that actually depends on it, which in this case is just a policy. And then we multiply with this probability of selecting that action and divide by that. And the reason to do that is to get something that looks like an expectation again, where we're weighting each action with the probability that it's selected. Now, the next step is just a notational thing. And actually, in the Sutton and Bartow book, they typically don't make this step. They just keep the formulation as uh, on the equality before, where we're just dividing by the policy. But if you have a gradient of something divided by that something itse itself, you can write that down as the gradient of the logarithm of that thing. This is just because the, the gradient of the logarithm is, uh, sorry, the gradient of log x is 1 over x. But now we have something that, like I said, looks like an expectation again, because we have a summation over states and then weighting of these states according to the distribution. And then we have a summation over actions, weighted according to the probability of selecting each of these actions. So we can write this again as an expectation, where the expectation is now over the gradient of the logarithm of pi times the reward, which is something we can sample. The ds uh, is now captured in the fact that the state is random. The ds, um, I again apologize for this not being a mu in all of the slides. It's sometimes a mu, it's sometimes a, a, a d. That's just a distribution over states. So when, when I say this is an expectation, I mean it's an expectation both over the states and the actions. So if, one way to think about that is that there's, uh, if you follow this policy, there's going to be some states that you end up in. In the bandit case, we could actually uh, even pick a distribution that doesn't depend on your policy. We're just going to have certain states which are given to you, um, a distribution over states. So each time you end up in some states, you have a policy that depends on that state. There's some distribution over those states, and this distribution happens to be ds in this case. So it's used on the first line already. We're just expanding that, uh, that expectation by saying there is some distribution over states. And we don't actually care what it is, because it basically keeps fixed throughout the derivation. 
And in the end, we're just folding it back into the notation of the expectation. So we didn't touch the distributional states in this case, which we can do because it doesn't depend on our policy in the, in the banded case. So then we have this equality, as, as on the previous two slides, where we have something that we can sample. So a simple stochastic gradient, uh, stochastic policy gradient update is then just to change our parameters in this way, which is something that was also uh, in the uh, homework assignment for the banded case, although we didn't really have states there. There was basically only one state. Um, so one easy extension of this is when there are different observations, for instance, you're still doing a bandit in the sense that you take an action, you immediately get a reward and the episode terminates, but maybe there are different observations now. There's different states you can be in, and that's sometimes called a contextual bandit. And then you could have a policy. You could imagine having a policy that doesn't just uh, give you certain action selection probabilities in general, but it will actually give you action selection probabilities that depend on the state, that depend maybe on the observations that you get. But you could still use basically the same algorithm in that case. So, for instance, again, the policy here could be a deep neural network or something like that, or a small neural network or a linear function that takes the state or the observation as input and then outputs these probabilities, which allows it to pick different probabilities in each state. So in expectation, this follows the actual gradient, which is nice because then we know we will actually under the normal assumptions, reach a local optima, or if this is a linear function, we might even reach a global optima, um, which is nice because these stochastic gradient algorithms are fa fairly well understood. There's also a nice intuition here. Um, what, does this, what does this equation mean? How, could, how should we read this? Well, essentially what we're doing here is we're adding something to, the, to, the, to these uh, policy parameters that is proportional to some step size, alpha, and the reward, and then this gradient. So what does this gradient mean? Well, um, it's essentially proportional to the, uh, to the probability of selecting that action. And what it means, it will increase the probability for actions that you've selected if they had a high reward, because the reward mul just multiplies this gradient in. Um, sorry, just multiplies with this gradient. So the one way to imagine this, this is that the probability of selecting an action will go up whenever the reward is high and will go down whenever the reward is negative. Now, if all your rewards are positive, this still works because what essentially will happen is the probabilities for actions that have higher rewards will go up more than the probabilities of actions that don't have as high rewards, which will turn in the end turn out to give you the right property that the probability of selecting the actions with the higher rewards will go up compared to the probability of selection, selecting actions that have a lower reward. So that's roughly the intuition here. This is why it's kind of natural to have the reward there, which, which basically tells you how much you're moving in the direction of uh, increasing the actions that you selected. Sorry. So just to make that more concrete, it's nice to have an example where you can basically see that. So we'll again consider the softmax policy where we have some preferences and previously in the bandit lecture, we had these things depend only on the action. So we literally had a value per action, which was the preference of selecting an action. Here we slightly generalize that to say, uh, maybe you have a table, maybe there's no other parameters than this, but for each state that you might not end up in and for each action, we have a preference now. So th this is, means that the preference might be different for different states, which is a generalization of the previous, uh, of the bandit case. So again, this is a contextual bandit case, but it actually can also will extend to when we have sequential problems. <clears throat> and then one way to define a policy is uh, in this way, which is called a softmax or a Boltzmann uh, policy sometimes, where we basically make the probability of selecting an action proportional to the exponentiated preference. The quantity there, the summation over the exponents uh, that we're dividing by is just to normalize so that the summation over all actions will sum to one, which is of course needed to make it a valid probability distribution. In that case, if we look at this gradient, it turns out to look like this, where the gradient of the logarithm of this policy is just the gradient of the preference of the action. And note in the previous slide, typically we consider the gradient of the log probability of the action you actually selected 
in the state that you were actually in. This is of AT in ST. So that's maybe something to keep in mind here. What, what, what this will do is it will give you the gradient of the preference of the action you selected. And then basically the other part is for the normalization. That comes from the uh, division there. So it'll push up the preferences for actions that have a high reward. And it'll push down the preference for actions that have a very uh, large negative reward, say. That's just an example, but you can parameterize other policies as well, of course. But it's a very common one to use the softmax. Now, of course, we want to extend this to the multi-step full reinforcement learning problem, where there's sequentiality and um, there's not just immediate reward and that's it, but we want to have values rather than immediate rewards. Now, it turns out there's a nice property there. There's the policy gradient theorem, which is a nice theoretic result. That means that we can basically replace the instantaneous reward with the long-term value. And it applies to the start state objective, the average reward, and the average value objective. Um, and the important thing here is just the way, the way this thing looks is that the gradient of those objectives basically all looks the same, where we just have this uh, gradient of the log probability of selecting the action times the value of that action, the long-term value of that action. And I'll derive that in a moment, so you can see that this is actually the case. And it's actually slightly tricky to derive this um, accurately, and there's uh, some versions in the literature where people do something that is slightly different, so just to be aware of that. Where the expectation is again over the states and actions. So for instance, if we're considering the, uh, um, the average value case or the average reward case, in both of those cases you would just follow your policy and you would sample the states depending on where you actually end up in with your policy. And then you would look at the actions that you actually take in those cases, which is a very natural thing to do. You basically just sample the experience online as it is given to you, and that will be a valid sample for this expectation in that case. So importantly, the policy gradients don't need to know the dynamics. So that's maybe kind of surprising. Shouldn't we know how the policy influences the states? How can we get, a, get around not having to know that? Well, this comes from the derivation, which I'll now show you. So what we'll do, we'll step through this a little bit in detail. So stop me whenever you're confused about anything, because it's uh, important to understand this. And what we'll do is we'll just consider some trajectory. Where I use this uh, Greek sim symbol to basically denote the trajectory, just a shorthand, which has some return. So the return depends on the trajectory. This is a random uh, value. This is just shorthand that allows us to write these things down very uh, condensely. But just think of it as you've, you've run your ro robots, you restart at something we arbitrarily call time step t0. So we start off in state 0, we take action 0, then we get a reward, uh, which in the sequential case we always say reward as at time t plus 1. So the reward is r1, and we end up in state uh, 1. And there we continue again, we pick a new action a1, and so on, and so on. We create this whole trajectory of data. Now a valid objective is then just to say, okay, I want the expected um, return to be high. Because the expected return is just the expected value. Because the return is just an unbiased sample for the actual value of your policy. Which means that in the very first uh, uh, equation there, we say the gradient of our objective is just the gradient of the expectation of this return. Now we can use very similar to before, we can use this score function trick to basically say, sure, the gradient of an expectation is just um, the expectation of that thing times the gradient of the logarithm of the probability of that happening. So this P um, Greek letter, I don't remember which one it is. <laughs> um, apologies. Uh, is, just, is, is the probability of this full trajectory, right? This is not just of an intermediate step in there, it's the full trajectory. So what is that thing? We'll write it out. So the gradient of the logarithm of the probability is the gradient of the logarithm of this huge multiplication. It is the probability of starting in S0, then taking A0 in S0, then the probability of ending up in S1 when you've taken 
action 0 in state 0. And then again in that state taking action 1 and so on and so on and so on. But because there's a logarithm in front, this multiplication can be turned into a sum. Because the logarithm of a product is just the sum of the logarithms. So we did that here, where we just write out, we put the log in front of all of these terms and we just write it out as one big sum. But then we realize that we're actually taking the gradient with respect to the policy parameters of this big sum. Now the gradient of a sum is just the gradients of each of the parts summed together. So, but when we do that and we inspect this thing, we notice that the dynamics, when conditioned on the action, so for instance consider that probability of ending up in state 1, when you're in state 0 and you select action 1, that thing doesn't depend on the policy parameters, because it's already conditioned on the action. The only thing that does depend on the policy parameters are the policy uh, the, the terms that have the policy in them in here. Which means that this thing is the same as the gradient of the sum of just the parts that have the policy in there. The gradient of the other parts, another way to say that, the gradient for instance of the uh, dynamics of going to state 1 when in state 0 taking uh, action, action 0, the gradient of that is 0 with respect to the policy parameters. But this means that we can write down the objective that we had at the top, this gradient log of the probability of the trajectory, we can write it out as being the gradient of the summation over all of the action probabilities along the way. In some sense, the, the way to think about that is that the parameters only affect your decisions, they don't affect the dynamics, so they don't come into play in the objective. You can't change the dynamics, so this is why they don't show up. Okay, so now one final thing that I did here is just to write out that trajectory, um, sorry, the return, which is just the summation of the rewards. That's just the definition of the return. For this trajectory, as given at the top there, the return is just the summation of the rewards, and it might be nice to write that down explicitly, so we have the expectation of this thing at the, top, uh, at the bottom there. So is the return sometimes discounted? Yes, uh, sorry, in this case I didn't have discounting in there. Um, you should definitely consider the discounted case as well. Um, I should have probably just put the discounts in for generality. Thank you. Um, by the way, there's many seats still sprinkled if people want to sit. Um, let me do two more slides and then we'll have a short break. Um, this is a general thing that is important, but it's also a little bit of an aside because I'm going to use this on the next slide. We're going to go back to the objective that I just arrived here. So for now, let, I'll get back to that in a moment. Um, but first we're going to do something intermediate, which is that we're going to realize that we can use baselines. This was discussed in the exploration exploitation lecture as well. Um, and one way to think about that is that we, um, as I said, the policy gradients, they look kind of intuitive in the sense that if you have an action that had a high reward, you're going to improve that, uh, the, the probability, you're going to increase the probability of selecting an action. If it had a negative reward, you're going to decrease it. But if all the rewards are positive, you're actually always increasing all the preferences, but then you're increasing some more than others. But turns out that has a higher variance than if you can sometimes push them up or another, and others push them down. And an easy way to reduce the variance is to have a baseline which means you, for instance, track the average reward across all actions and you just subtract that from the reward. Then the way the preferences move is if you have an, an action that has a higher than expected uh, reward, you'll increase the preference of that action. And if it's lower than expected, you'll decrease it. This turns out to have lower variance and it's valid to do that because of this. So what I've done here, I've picked some arbitrary b, which I could have actually made a function of state. So maybe it's good to keep that in mind. Let b be a function of state, but not of the actions. And I multiply that with this gradient of the log of the, of the probability of selecting the action. And I'll just write that out a little bit. So the thing there on the left hand side, both the state and the action are random. Then I expand the action part here on the right. So now only the state is random. The action is fully determined because we're summing over all the actions. 
and we take the probability of selecting that action in that state. Then um, I note that the gradient of the logarithm of pi is the gradient of pi divided by pi. So I'm essentially doing the score function trick, but I'm doing it in reverse. What we did before, but the other way around. Which means we can write out this thing as the gradients, the sum of the gradients pi, and then I just pulled the gradient outside. Because the sum of these gradients is the same as the gradient of the sum. But then something interesting happens. This summation over policies must sum to 1. This is a probability distribution. So if we sum over all actions, this summation must be 1. Which means that we're looking at the expectation of some arbitrary baseline b, which might be a function of state, times the gradient of a constant. But the gradient of a constant is 0, which means that this whole thing is 0. Now, why was I allowed to do that? Uh, essentially, it's because b, by assumption, does not depend on the action. If it did depend on the action, I couldn't pull it out of the sum, as I did here. And if you can't pull it out of the sum, that means that the gradient is not necessarily 0. But if it doesn't depend on the action, then this is 0, which means we can add these arbitrary baselines to reduce variance without changing the expectation of the update. The expected update will remain the same, we're just changing the variance. So one thing that this implies is that we can subtract a baseline. But the other thing that, we, that this implies is that we had this big product of two, two summations here. We arrived at that two slides before. One is the return, right? It's the summation of all the rewards you've seen in this trajectory. And the other one is the summation of all of the gradient log pi's of that same trajectory. But it turns out, some of these rewards don't depend on some of these actions. In particular, we know that the rewards up to some time step k do not depend on the actions that you take after that time step. They are conditionally independent. And what that means is that we can take this thing, I've rewritten it slightly. This is the same thing, but I've just switched the sums. I put the sum of the, the rewards there at the end instead of at the beginning. But then we can we can essentially use this conditional independence of some of the rewards on some of the actions to say, hey, we actually only need to look at the rewards that follow each of these actions. So for each of the actions, we're now going to only look at the return that happened after you took that action, which makes intuitive sense. This action only affects things that happen after it. It cannot affect things that happened before because of causality. But that means we can actually write that sum, which starts at now t rather than 0 as the value of the policy. Which brings us back to the policy gradient theorem, because this is essentially exactly what the policy gradient theorem says, that this first thing is equal to this last thing, where we've now summed over a whole trajectory. So um, this expectation basically says we, we look at all of the states, the policy gradient theorem, as I had it before, only looked at one of them. But of course, if this trajectory is on policy, it is on the same distribution, then these things are the same apart from uh, a multiplier that is the length of the uh, trajectory. So one thing that I hid in a little bit here is that this, this uh, objective that we had at the beginning is very similar to the objective we had before. But instead of considering one state, we consider many states at the same time um, of a full tra trajectory. So the magnitude of these things is uh, slightly different, but the principle is exactly the same. And this gives us back this very nice formulation where essentially each of the updates now that we could do is just the gradient of the log of this one action times the value that you expect that action to have. This will do, if you sample this, you could view this as one big batch updates where you consider doing many updates at once. You could also consider doing each of them separately. You don't have to do the full sum, right? You could do each of them separately and you have a valid, valid policy gradient uh, algorithm. But just for the simplicity of the derivation, I kept the sum inside there. Did you get the cue from using the poly, policy gradient theorem from earlier? Uh, the cue is just by definition. We have a return here, which is the rewards following time step t, but it's within the expectation. So we can just write that down by definition as being the value of that, uh, of that action in that state. So I didn't apply the policy gradient theorem. In fact, you could view this as being a proof of the policy gradient theorem, in a sense. <laughs>
Um, so the reason the magnitude is different, so a good question, sorry, um, is because I started out with considering this whole trajectory. I didn't consider one state in the trajectory, I'm considering all states in the trajectory. So the objective here is essentially um, scaled by the number of states I'm considering. The policy gradient theorem, if I just go back there, um, this one wants for one random state and one random action, and as you'll see here, there's a slight difference here where we're now considering a summation over random states and actions. So I'm pointing out that these are the same except for a scaling factor, which is how many states am I considering in this summation. Um, so you, that, this is why I pointed out you can consider sampling this summation, but it's also perfectly valid to sample each of them individually and consider them separate updates instead of always looking at the summation as a, as a whole thing. Because you can easily pull the summation out and you can, you can just sample each of them individually. And it's often better, of course, uh, in practice, especially if you're doing uh, deep neural networks, it's often better to have mini batches, which means you consider a few at the same time and you update once for a few, few samples. Um, not one, not all of them, but somewhere in between. And this tends to give us good learning algorithms. And you're essentially free to do that. <laughs> so before, uh, before going onwards with the rest of the, uh, rest of the slides, let me quickly just stop here because also based on these uh, uh, very good questions I get on the break. Um, I, will, I already realized before doing all of this, this, is, this stuff is fairly subtle and it's fairly hard to um, grog if you haven't seen it before. So I really encourage you to go and um, read the relevant part in the Sutton and Bartow book. I believe this is now in chapter 13. I'll look it up, I'll put it onto the... Uh... Do you know what uh, last week's lecture was? Or sorry, Monday's, yeah. Tuesday's. Tuesday's lecture, yeah, that was... Um, um, they renumbered these chapters, so I have to, I think chapter nine is function approximation these days. So most of it will be captured there. Um, what we haven't, what we've basically skipped over in terms of the chapters, uh, we did chapters one to six. We skipped over chapter seven a little bit, although I said some things. Uh, Sorry, chapter, chapter seven is, I think, the end steps. We did cover them a little bit. Chapter eight is planning. We skipped over that. I'll get back to that in the next lecture. And chapter nine was then function approximation, which seems because you're already taking, fun you're getting function approximation in the other part of the course. So it's actually easier to fold that in. Um, there's many chapters in the book later on, especially after chapter nine that become, well, chapter 10 is basic, chap chapters 9 and 10 are, are together in terms of function approximation, where chapter 10 is just about the control case. Um, the later chapters become more things that you can actually look at individually as well, without necessarily going through them in sequence, which is kind of what we're doing here as well. Um, but the policy gradient chapter, which I, again, believe is chapter 13, will go through these things a little bit more at ease in some sense. There's also a nice paper by uh, Rich Sutton and others um, in which he derives the policy gradient theorem and proves the policy gradient theorem. So if you want to step through that a little bit more at ease, which can be quite uh, useful, um, I'll put in the, in the lecture materials on Moodle, I'll put in that paper so you can look at that. Um, he's a good communicator, so it's, it's a nice paper that, that, that's fairly easy to read. And of course, the, uh, the chapter in the book is also very readable. Um, so maybe for now the best is just to absorb and suspend your disbelief a little bit and uh, trust that these things actually work, but also not trust that it's very good to be skeptical. But uh, just to continue, um, I used on this slide, this is the last slide where we ended up here, I used this thing that we proved where if something doesn't depend on an action that we can basically toss it in because it's, 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 uh, its gradient will be zero, or the expectation of this thing times the gradient will be zero. I mentioned this in terms of the baseline. We can add a baseline, but then I actually used it to, to get things out. I used the fact that rewards don't depend on later actions, and I basically removed those rewards for the, from the summation there, which is a step that's often glossed over when people derive policy gradient algorithms, but I thought it was good to just put in there explicitly. But a goal, of course, this is something we did in the exploration and exploitation lecture as well. We could also use it to add something. In this case, we subtract a baseline. Um, so this is, again, just a policy gradient thing, which we had down there. I kept the summation over time, over the trajectory. You could also just get rid of that summation and say we only consider one specific random uh, state at the time. 
And then because this value does not depend on the action, per the small proof we had two slides ago, um, the expectation of this thing, the, the value times this uh, gradient of the log policy, the expectation of that will be zero. So it's completely fair game to put it in there. These things are equal, but it might reduce your variance quite a bit. But now something interesting happened because in the previous slide we were basically uh, implicitly because we haven't actually sampled it yet. But of course we have these expectations and the idea behind these expectations is that you then sample them. So what we were doing here is implicitly we're using Monte Carlo returns to sample. Undiscounted ones as mentioned before in a good question. In general you want to look at the discounted uh, Monte Carlo returns of course if you're using discounting. But um, here, something happens where if we want to have this baseline, you don't want to put the same Monte Carlo return in here because then you're basically dividing, you're, you're, you're subtracting zero from zero. And the Monte Carlo return also depends on the action. So you can't actually do that without changing the expectation. So instead, we want to approximate this. We want to put some baseline in to reduce the variance. And maybe it's not too important that this baseline is exactly correct because this is just a baseline that you could put in. Um, and as I said in like the first line, a good baseline is the actual value for that state. But it's not the only baseline you could consider. You could just put anything in there and it wouldn't change the expectation. But if you to use the actual value, it tends to reduce the variance quite well. But of course we can just approximate this and that's what we'll do. So we estimate this explicitly, for instance using TD learning, on policy TD learning. And in addition we can sample the, uh, the other part, the QPI, we can sample this using the Monte Carlo return, but we could also use an n-step return. For instance, if we do the one-step return, this will just be the reward plus the discounted next value according to our same approximation, and then minus the approximation that we had for this one, which means that the whole thing becomes a TD error. So we're multiplying then the gradient of the log pi with the TD error, which again has the intuitive intuition that if your temporal difference error is positive, that means there was a happy surprise and you're going to improve the uh, probability, increase the probability of selecting that action again. Yeah? Um, what is the Monte Carlo uh, return again? So the Monte Carlo return is just your flat, um, potentially discounted sum of rewards until termination. And when I use this notation GT, that's the Monte Carlo return. If I have a superscript with an N, this means we take n steps and then we bootstrap on the value function. So the one step version that is down here takes one actual reward from your trajectory and then bootstraps on the value at state t plus one. Um, let me just quickly skip ahead. Here's an example where we take multiple steps. So here's a more gener generic formulation of uh, an n step return as we call these. So the n here refers to how many steps we take until we bootstrap. And we appropriately discount in this version, so there's a discount factor here on the bootstrapping, which is to the power n, because that's how many steps we took before we actually used a, an estimate for the rest of the return. So this value here stands in for the remaining return, which you would have gotten if you would have continued indefinitely. To return here. So you could just keep the one step uh, return in mind as a potential po possibility. And then we can note that the critic, the value function here, which we now can call a critic because of this terminology of actor critic uh, methods, um, it's solving a familiar problem, policy evaluation for the current policy. So the question is that it's trying to answer what is the value of the policy that depends on some parameters for the current parameters? And this problem was explored in the previous lecture. We could, you could use Monte Carlo uh, rollouts to estimate this. You just follow your policy for a while. You just do regression to make a value function look a lot like, this, like those uh, returns. You could also bootstrap, learn a guess from a guess using temporal difference learning or multi-step temporal difference learning. So this was all discussed in the previous lecture for the case of function approximation and of course earlier in the course. And to make that explicit, here's an algorithm. So the critic will have a value function that is updating with some parameters w. This is just the weights of your network if, if v is a neural network. And in this case the algorithm itself will use multi-step but it won't actually do multi, it will do one step temporal difference learning. And the actor will use the policy gradient algorithms as, we as we've just derived to update the parameters of the policy. 
So how does it then look? First you initialize, oh sorry, there's a w missing there. You should of course also initialize the parameters of your value function. You initialize the first state, uh, the parameters of your policy and the parameters of your value function. And then you basically have an indefinite loop where at each step you sample an action from your current policy, which is stochastic. You apply that action into the world and then you get a, uh, a reward in the next state, which here I just denoted you sample the reward in the next state. Maybe you have a simulator, maybe you have, you're running this on an actual physical robot, so you just observe, observe a reward in the next state. And then one thing we could do is use the one step TD error, that's one possibility, um, which means we just reuse that reward and we bootstrap immediately on the value at the next state to stand in for the remaining return of that uh, current policy. And then we subtract the value at the current state just as a baseline. This turns it into a temporal difference error, which is also sometimes called, um, so the algorithm as a whole is sometimes called advantage actor critic because the action value minus the state value, which is uh, which is the expectation of your temporal difference error is sometimes called the advantage function. It basically, the terminology comes from the fact that you can consider your, your state value and then the action values are offset by that state value in some sense. But if you subtract that state value out again, you're only looking at the advantage of taking one action compared to another one. Some advantages will be positive, some advantages will be negative for certain actions. Um, and if you sample that thing, that's your temporal difference error. And just terminology-wise, this is why it's sometimes called advantage actor critic, just to make you aware of these terms because they're used in the literature. Then we do a very familiar thing to update the policy, sorry, the, the uh, critic parameters of our value function. Um, I've introduced a new step size here, beta. This is exactly the same thing that we had before as alpha, but I just want to differentiate that you might use a different step size for your policy compared to for your value function. But essentially, the update is something we've seen before, which is we're updating our, our parameters of the value function w by adding a step size times the temporal difference error times the gradient with respect to those parameters of your value function. This is exactly the same as what we had in the, in the previous lecture. And then the policy gradient algorithm looks very similar in some sense, where we're now adding a step size times the temporal difference error, but we're multiplying the log probability of selecting the action that you've actually selected. Uh, sorry, the gradient of that. Which is your policy gradient update? Yes. Uh, would it be possible to kind of construct a policy that makes this a generalization or almost equivalent to uh, a, a Q learning variant? That's a, ver a very good question. So, can you construct a certain ver parameterization of your policy so that this becomes almost equivalent to doing action values? And it turns out the answer is yes. Um, in particular, if you construct a policy parameterization that is somehow more constrained, so that these log probabilities, um, you can basically construct it in such a way that these log probabilities, they go exactly to the action values. In general, it's less constrained, so these prob log probabilities can go up or down, and they don't really have semantics of a value. But turns out if you put certain regularizations in, in there, it turns out that neural queue learning where this would be a gradient of q rather than the gradient of log pi. And this algorithm, they can be made to look exactly alike. They can be made to do the exact same updates. But that's for a specific case. In general, this is a more generic thing in the sense that these log probabilities are not constrained to have the semantics of a prediction. That's a very good question. There's a, a paper by John Schulman on archive in which he proves for a specific version of this and a specific version of Q-learning that these things do the exact same updates. So this is the um, slide I didn't get to in the last lecture where we expand this a little bit more. It's the same algorithm as on the previous slide, but I've just generalized it slightly more and made it also in some sense a little bit more concrete. Um, this would this you could say constitutes almost a full agent. If you implement all of this, you could just run that on something uh, at scale perhaps and you might get interesting results. So we start off with uh, some representation, which could be very simple. So it could be that your representation just takes the observations, but I made it slightly more general where I said maybe your uh, current agent state, ST, doesn't just depend on your current observation, but it might also depend on your previous agent state. For instance, you might be using a recurrent neural network and 
We have a network that maps each state to a value. We have a network that maps each state to a policy. These are your critic and your uh, actor. And in, in a specific instance of this algorithm, one thing that has been done in the past is to actually copy this policy a number of times and have a number of simulators so you get a lot of data at the same time. This is just an implementation thing. It doesn't actually touch the core learning algorithm that much, except in the way that you generate the data. But it's something that has been done in practice, so I just wanted to put it on the slide as an example of something that you might do if you have access to simulators. Then one thing we could do is construct a multi-step temporal difference loss. Um, one thing that I didn't put in here is that the Monte Carlo return, the multi-step Monte Carlo return, uh, should have a stop gradient on the value that you're bootstrapping on. Um, so there should be a stop gradient here when you bootstrap, because otherwise you're not doing temporal difference learning, you're doing something more like the residual Bellman uh, update that we discussed last lecture. But I didn't actually put it on the slide. If you don't do that, if you get to do that, it'll probably still work, especially if you, if you use multi-step returns where n is not 1, but it's maybe 10 or 20. Um, but it might work a little less well. It's still a valid algorithm, but it's a slightly different one. And then we could also construct a multi-step reinforce loss, and I put loss here between quotes, because this is something that we maybe do for convenience when implementing this in, say, TensorFlow, because TensorFlow has optimizers that they expect you to give them a loss, but in fact what we derived wasn't a loss, it was a gradient, it was an update. But you can turn it into a loss by essentially getting rid of the gradient before the log pi. Um, this is a little bit of a weird thing, because it's not really a loss, but if you take the gradient of this, it turns out to do the update that we wanted to do. So that's one way to basically trick your TensorFlow program into uh, doing a, an update that you wanted to do by saying, I can turn it into something when, such that when I actually take the gradient of it, it'll turn into the update that I want it to, to be. This is actually quite similar to the temporal difference thing when we put the stop gradient in there. The stop gradient is there basically to trick TensorFlow not taking the full gradient, but taking something that um, the Sutton and Bartow book calls a semi-gradient, so you can use it as a loss. Okay, and then you just toss it into an optimizer, for instance, the atom optimizer or something like that, and you minimize these, uh, these losses. Um, I'm not 100% sure whether, I put, whether there should be a minus sign there on the, on the reinforced loss. So. Maybe you want to try putting a minus sign there or not. I was trying to reason through that quickly. Anyway, um, you, could, you could carefully look at that and see whether it needs one or not. So this is sometimes known as A2C, which is just short for advantage actor critic. Or in the literature, it's also sometimes called A3C because this was in practice combined with asynchronous parameters update, parameter updates. This is why I highlighted that part for maybe you have multiple copies. One thing you could do is you could have multiple learners in different places on different simulators and they're all trying to update the parameters but there's one shared parameter set and then all these updates go in there asynchronously and then that's why it's sometimes called A3C for asynchronous advantage actor critic. That's basically an implementation detail. It does change the algorithm in terms of the actual updates but in terms of the, the, the objective it doesn't really uh, change much so I won't go into too much detail on that. Okay, so now we um, should be a little bit careful because the policy gradient objective is for your current policy. What's the return? Use that to update your policy. Um, but if you're going to approximate that, for instance, by bootstrapping, you're going to introduce some bias. And this might or might not be a problem, but if you have a very biased policy gradient estimate, then you might not find the right solution. If you use the full return for your current policy, you just take your policy, you run with it for a while, you get an unbiased estimate for the value of that policy. So that one's fine, but it has high variance. If we're going to bootstrap, for instance, immediately using temporal difference learning, you might have a high bias, but the variance will be quite low. But sometimes the bias is too high and the gradient doesn't actually point in the right direction, in which case your algorithm, depending also on the function approximation that you use and on the optimizer that you're using, might actually go the wrong way. And it might lead to poor policies. So this is why multi-step temporal difference errors are especially useful maybe in this case and they're very often used where we take a number of steps so that we have a lower bias but we might not take all of the steps, we might not do a full Monte Carlo rollout so we still reduce the variance a little bit and this turns out to be quite uh, successful in, in training these things. <coughs> 
Another thing that's important is that we actually have on-policy uh, trajectories, targets. So again, one way to do that is just to roll out your policy, say use the Monte Carlo return, roll it out all the way till the end. This will give you an on-policy estimate. But sometimes you get data for a policy that's not quite the policy that you have right now. For instance, the data may have generated with a policy that you were using just before, like a few steps before. You've updated it in the meantime, your policy is now different, but the data is from a previous policy. That's one way they could be off policy. Another way, of course, is that the data actually comes from a completely different source. Maybe you've observed uh, data from uh, another simulator where another policy was run, or maybe you have some data due to humans acting in a certain setting. In those cases, it's very important to correct for the, uh, the bias in your estimate. And for instance, you can use important sampling. And the way I wrote it down here quite condensely is using a recursive way to write that down, where the end step uh, important sampling sampled uh, return, which I denote here with a row because this um, fraction is sometimes uh, written shorthand as row. Um, you can write this recursively by just considering one step and then the remaining n minus one steps. And again, um, important sampled at the next time step, where if you roll this out all the way to the uh, where n becomes zero, because n on each step will become one lower, at the end you bootstrap. And we are assuming that this value is a valid approximation for the policy we're actually interested in. This is an assumption, right? It will have a little bit of bias because you won't have an exact approximation there. Um, but then this is, this is one way to define that important sample's return. This is very similar to the important sample we've discussed in a previous lecture, but we're applying it recursively. And then one thing I wanted to point out is that you could also do something slightly different from the end step returns. Um, Again, I'm writing these things out recursively. For now, I just got rid of the important sampling ratios, which you should put in there if you're of policy. But for simplicity, I just took out. So I'm now considering the on-policy case. But I wanted to point out that this can be generalized in a way. So the recursive formulation here is that you, you take n steps, which means you first take one step, and then you take n minus one steps. This is just a different way to write out that random uh, return. And then at the end, you bootstrap. So this is equivalent to writing it out in this more generic way, where we don't have these two cases, but we only have one case. But we put in a parameter that is uh, called lambda t plus 1. And this is equivalent if you have lambda being equal to 1, because in that case, this value part disappears. There's 1 minus lambda there. That part goes to 0. So you can think of this lambda parameter now as a binary switch, which says, do I step one more, or do I bootstrap here? And then these things are equivalent if you First step a few steps, and then all of a sudden you set this lambda to zero, which means we're zeroing out the rest of the return, and instead we're using the value to bootstrap on fully. And the generalization I then wanted to just point out is that you could consider using lambda parameters which are not binary. So you don't deterministically step a few steps and then you bootstrap, but maybe on each of the steps you bootstrap a little bit. Or maybe you even bootstrap conditionally. And one way to then correct for off-policy returns is to bootstrap whenever you take an action that was very unlikely or even impossible under the policy that you're interested in now. So that's a different way to think about how to correct for off-policy returns. The other uh, reason I call this out is because lambda returns are quite often quoted in the literature. And essentially, they're a generalization of the n-step return. Another way to think about them is that they can be interpreted as a mixture of n-step returns. This is all covered in the Sutton and Barto book in, in chapter 12 in quite a lot of depth, much more depth than we'll go into for this course because this is basically all I'm going to say about that. Uh, Multi-step returns with just a fixed n are also quite often used these days in practice because they're quite easy to implement. And one problem if you have a lambda return where this lambda is not zero or one is that it might, might mean that you need indefinitely long rollouts in order to even compute this thing. There's ways around that, but we won't have time to go into that in this course. OK, so this is just a generic formulation of return. You can then use that to update both your critic or your policy, or uh, similarly, uh, your value function or your, uh, your prediction or your, uh, or your policy gradient. Um, so you can consider this basically an aside. Don't feel free to think about it more, but for now, you can forget about it again. I just wanted to talk more about the policy optimization bit and what is hard and what is easy about this. We already had a concrete algorithm just now, which you could implement, you could just run, and it might do something interesting. 
But there, it turns out in practice there are certain problems which, if you think about them, are quite um, intuitive, but they might not be immediately apparent if you, if you just think about the objective and optimizing it. And this, for this reason, many extensions and variants have been proposed over the years. And one thing that's important is to be careful with your updates because, vitally, we're changing the policy, which means we're changing the data distribution. So if you somehow mess up at some point and you create a policy that is very poor, it just stands in a corner and tries to drive into the wall or something like that, the data will become very poor, which means it becomes very hard to learn something meaningful after that, which is why it's very important to have policies that are somewhat reasonable. This is different from the supervised learning case where learning and data are typically independent. We just have a data set and we can't mess it up by our learning process. So we can just do basically anything during the learning process without necessarily making it impossible to recover. But because in the reinforcement learning setting, the data and the learning are very uh, tightly coupled, you have to maybe be a little bit more careful. So one solution is to regularize the policy, for instance, by making it not change too much. This is a common, practice, uh, common method in practice these days. So the goal is to prevent instability and also maybe for it to lock in too quickly into things that aren't good. And a popular way to do that is to limit the difference between subsequent policies. So what we'll do here is we'll consider the policy before doing an update, which we'll call, say, pi old. And we're considering the, the, the policy after the update, which is the pi theta, the thing that we're considering changing. Now, pi old doesn't have to be the actual policy exactly at the previous time step, but that's one way, way to think about it. But essentially what we'll do here is we'll define a divergence. So if you haven't seen kobach leibler divergences before, don't worry, but this is just how they're, they're defined. But the way to think about it is that the divergence is like a distance metric, but it's defined between distributions and it's not actually symmetric. So it's not a metric, but that's okay. You can still use it as if it's just the distance between these two policies. So what does this thing mean? It's very akin to having like a square distance error, where we basically say we don't want pi theta to be too different from pi old. So we're considering a normal policy gradient update, but at the same time we're regularizing uh, the policy not to change too much. And this is a very nice thing to be able to do because you can put in other policies here as well. For instance, you could have a certain control policy that you know is fairly safe on say a robot that you want to run. And you could say, I want to look at any solution you can find, but all of them have to be a little bit close to this one because I know that's safe. Um, then the idea is just to maximize whatever objective you picked. So the normal policy gradient objective of increasing the value. And you just regularize by adding this term with maybe some small eta parameter that just uh, basically tells the system how much should I care about this regularizer compared to the actual overall objective. In addition, it can help to use large batches for uh, many reasons. One is to reduce the variance. And I just wanted to point out there's multiple algorithms that use this that are used quite a lot in practice. Um, one is called trust region policy optimization, where the idea to think about this is that this uh, regularizer basically defines a region in which we trust our new policy. So this is why it's called a trust region. And similarly, there's a PPO algorithm, which is basically uh, Maybe you could consider a follow-up on, uh, on TRPO. Um, and these are used quite commonly in practice and quite successfully. And they both use this uh, trick. And let's see. One thing that I wanted to show is just if you run this, that it actually works. Just to give you some idea. I showed this in the first lecture as well, I think. Um, now, of course, getting these things to work completely in practice, it requires a little bit of engineering and tuning and things like that. But otherwise, this is basically just using one of those policy gradient algorithms. And it's trying to optimize the reward of going uh, forward as much as you can by changing the, uh, the way this system moves. So what's parameterized here is the way these limbs move compared to each other. The exact way is not that important. Um, but importantly, no information about the potential solutions was put in. There's just this reward, and then the policy gradient algorithm figures out how to change the parameters of the policy so that this thing works, walks forward. And turns out this algorithm is gener generic and general enough that it doesn't really matter what the exact nature of the problem is, in some sense, and it can learn to deal with all of these different body types and all of these different situations, and it can just learn to move forward. The previous two examples were where it's basically on a, on a line in a sense. In this case, it can actually move in the plane. It can also move left and right to avoid the obstacles. So it could basically pick to either climb over one 
or uh, maybe move around it if possible. What's the input to the algorithm? Is it just the pixels or...? <laughs> so what is often done in these cases, um, it's a very good question, and in um, the algorithm applies in both cases. Um, I don't actually know which one was used in this one. I should check. Uh, but especially in these type of demonstrations, what's quite often done is that we, we don't use the actual pixel input, but we use features. So there are certain sensors essentially of the robot, or in this case of the simulated robot. And instead of using like the full pixel observation, we just use those much smaller dimensional feature vector as an input, which includes also maybe things such as uh, feeling in a sense how different your joint is curved, which might be somewhat harder to read off of the pixels. You could learn to learn off the pixels, and people have done that as well. But sometimes it's much easier if you have certain features that you know are uh, quite useful. And in, indeed, we as humans, for instance, also use that. We don't just do things from our vision. We use our sense of balance. We use the fact that we kind of feel where our muscles are. So this might be quite useful for the learning process to put in there. Now, the video I showed before, you can imagine doing that in multiple ways. You could imagine still having a discrete action set where you have like a number of controls you could do. You could turn a certain amount to one way. You can move a joint a certain amount. Or you can consider this to be basically all, almost free form, con continuous. So the algorithms we discussed can be used in both of those cases. The only thing that's quite challenging, well, I mean, or maybe not the only thing, but one thing that's quite challenging in high dimensional continuous space is exploration. So let's consider a concrete example here. Let's say you have an action that is a real valued vector. Maybe it's bounded somehow or, or not. One thing you could do is you could define a Gaussian policy. So we have a mean that is state dependent, which might be parameterized with these policy parameters theta. And maybe for simplicity, let's just consider a fixed variance. Um, if this is a multivariate Gaussian, this would just be an identity matrix. I wrote it down here as if it's like a single number here. Um, so in this case, the action is a single, uh, uh, a single real number. And the expiration here is Gaussian, which means our policy is parameterized uh, as a Gaussian distribution, which means that the logarithm of that thing and then taking the gradient has this nice pleasing intuitive form where if you have a certain action, you're considering a certain action, the log probability of that action, the gradient of the log probability is the difference between the action and the proposed mean where of, of the Gaussian, divided by the squared variance, times the gradient of uh, the mean with respect to the parameters. Um, the mean here should probably be explicitly parameterized with theta, and then the gradient should also have the theta as a subscript, um, to be completely clear. And now, for instance, you can just use these algorithms that we talked about, um, reinforced or advantage extra critical like algorithms, these policy gradient algorithms, to update the pra parameters of this policy. You could, of course, also parameterize the variance as well and do that as well. Um, one other thing you could do, just to show that these intuitive algorithms, they can work quite well, is if you have an exploration algorithm, so we pick a certain action now from a policy which might be Gaussian, might be a continuous action. And one th easy thing we can do is just to do something a little bit more explicit than what we were doing before. We just look at the temporal difference error, and whenever the temporal difference error is positive, we're happily surprised, we're going to move the output of our actor towards this action. So we're not explicitly doing a policy gradient now, we're doing something that is maybe a little bit simpler. We have an actor that outputs a single number, we add some Gaussian noise around that, we evaluate that action and we see whether it was good. So we're doing something like hill climbing. Turns out this works and you can um, use this simple algorithm in interesting ways. So this is another video in which they train basically something similar to the thing you saw just now. And again, this doesn't necessarily uh, work out of the box immediately. It, it takes a little bit of challenge perhaps to um, even, sorry, let me just, to even define what the algorithm sees. This is again not done from pixels, but then you can make this work. Okay, so I guess we're running out of time. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll continue on next week um, when I'll talk a little bit more about policy gradients and about planning. Thank you. Sorry about that.